Welcome everyone to week four, lecture one. We are gonna talk about interrupted time series analysis, specifically uh, one approach to it called autoregressive integrated moving average time series analysis or ARIMA. And so let's get that going. So when do you use interrupted time series analysis? Well, when you have a time series, <laughs> some sort of dependent variable, and uh, you want to determine whether changes occurred in the series that correspond with events set one or more time points. So see if it inflected or changed, went up or down, corresponding with, usually with some sort of intervention or law change. So that begs the question, what is a time series? Well, a time series is when you have a dependent variable that is repeatedly measured over time. So not just once or twice, like, I mean, technically pre-post is a time series, but it's a really bad one. You want one that's measured a lot of times. So uh, maybe monthly, for example, they take measurements of recidivism rates or compliance or whatever, and you, you've got this monthly sort of uh, rate or count of things, and you want to know, uh, uh, look for changes in that, that would be time series. So usually the measurements are equally spaced. So, you know, annual measures, quarterly measures, monthly measures, but uh, they don't have to be perfectly equally spaced. I mean, even months aren't exactly the same number of days, right? But they should be similarly spaced. And they can be at the person level or they can be uh, more commonly at what we call the ecological level. They're aggregated. So. Like, for example, you could look at Billy's crash rates over time, which is, you know, monthly would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 right? Um, that's not particularly interesting. Or you could look at 16-year-old crash rates over time, which is aggregated across all 16-year-olds. And that's usually time series are done across groups at the ecological or aggregated level. So time series often have uh, what we call autocorrelation, and that is when future observations, so autocorrelation, you actually know these words, self-correlated. So future observations are correlated with past observations and vice versa. And as you guys know, when things are correlated, you can use them to predict the other, right? So uh, because past observations are correlated with future observations and vice versa, you can use them to predict uh, future observations. So we use the past to predict the future in time series. And a couple of things that you find that points that are closer in time tend to be more similar to each other. They're more strongly correlated they are, or they have higher uh, autocorrelation. If you think about it, like um, what do you think is more similar, temperature in July uh, or temperatures uh, July versus December, right? So things closer in time tend to be more similar to each other. <clears throat> we call that autocorrelation. They also tend to have uh, seasonal patterns. So pre at predictable intervals, they rise and fall, for example. So like flu season uh, in my work pops up every uh, fall when school starts. And so we have an increase in flu and then it goes, it's always lowest during the summer and it goes back up. And so it follows this pattern. And because it's predictable according to season of the year, we call that seasonality. So here's the time series. This is uh, US temperature. Um, deviation from average from 1880 to 2006, and this has many of the features of a time series. So we have uh, a trend. So over time, things have been getting warmer. Um, so that is what we call a trend as represented by the blue line. We have a, a local autocorrelation. If you see like years that are closer to each other tend to be more similar to each other than years that are further apart. And we uh, do have some evidence of seasonality. If it was in here, it would be like periods where sunspots uh, occur uh, sort of at a predictable cycle and things and result in higher versus lower deviations from temperature. So that's time series. So time series designs come out of this book by Campbell and Stanley from the 60s. Uh, and this is sort of how they talk about them in terms of measurements and then interruptions or uh, uh, intervention periods. So O is where a thing is measured over time. So time one, two, three, et cetera. And X is when some sort of event of interest or law change or you implement a policy uh, with, with folks, that sort of thing. So there's what we call the one group interrupted time series design. And it looks like this. Um, for time period 01, 02, 03, 04, et cetera, you're measuring some outcomes. So it could be crash rates on a road. It could be graduation rates at, uh, for a high school. And then when X occurs, which here it occurs in between time periods six and seven, 
Um, that is, they implemented some some policy or some law change that you expected to affect. Uh, uh, in in this example, the graduation rates, and you keep measuring that same outcome: 07, 08, 09, 10, etc. So, if policy X was expected to increase graduation rates, uh, you would expect that after the X occurs, that interruption in the time series, um, you have graduation rates increase; they go up. All right, so you've got your pre-time period, you've got your post-time period. And so here it's uh, weekly mean alcohol consumption before and after the midterms. Um, not the world's best design. The problem is if anything else happens in that in, during that time period uh, that could have affected, in this case, weekly alcohol consumption besides uh, midterms, um, like a sale or I don't know, um, it, it, there's no way to... Uh, detangle that sort of uh, uh, confounding from the actual effect of midterms. So the two group interrupted time series design is a somewhat better design. So here you've got two groups instead of just one that you're measuring. So you've got your treatment group and C is your control group and they're both being measured for 12 time periods. But note that uh, something happens for the treatment group and that thing does not happen for the control group. So you have a comparison to what would have happened, uh, expected to have happened in the control, uh, in the, via the control in the treatment group if um, the intervention actually hadn't happened. So you've got pre's in both versus posts in both, and you would expect if the intervention worked, you get a bigger change in the treatment group than the control group. At least here, you've got a comparison that you can look to. So for example, you could you could look at monthly average vehicle speed on a street and before and after a change in the posted speed limit that would be your treatment compared to a matched street that had similar pre volume so you'd want a, a, a road that's as similar as possible for the control i mean it had that same uh, uh pre speed limit as your treatment road but you didn't change speed limit so you'd see if um there's a change in crashes on your treatment group that is bigger than the change in crashes in your control group. And so it's a better design in that sense. You can rule out some confounding. So why not just compare pre to post, right? Why not just uh, average of the pre points, the average of the post points, call it a day? Well, first reason is seasonality. So here's a time series. This is the number of new driver licenses issued to 16 and 17 year olds, young teen drivers. And when you look at this, you might notice some uh, some peaks and valleys that seem to occur at predictable time periods. So let's say this was your pre-period for some intervention. You didn't have all this the data before that. You just had that, and that was your post-period. Well, you would find that um, uh, uh, if you hadn't taken seasonality into account and the fact that there's a seasonal pattern to this, if you compare pre to post, you're going to find post is higher, right? And maybe you... you uh, uh, did some law change or you uh, put out um, uh, key chains telling kids to get licensed, I, I don't know, or some sort of uh, voucher for driver education. You'd find that in the post period, yeah, more kids got licensed. Clearly our driver education worked when in reality it did not work. It just looks like it went up because it was following this natural pattern of seasonality. So that is a source of confounding. That would not be a fair comparison pre to post because it was going up anyway. And this is a way to lie with research. By, if you knew about this seasonal pattern, particularly picking that post period for your intervention to show that something went up, uh, that'd be lying with stats. So summer periods, June, August, tend to be the highest for licensure among teen drivers, which makes sense. They got the most time to do driver training. And so note that in your June, August periods, you tend to have these peaks of highest crash rates. Uh, Winter periods tend to be lowest. So similarly, um, in winter periods, for whatever reason, teens aren't getting licensed and they just tend uh, historically to be the lowest time periods. So you'd be comparing a historic high to a historic low. Uh, you'd be capitalizing on seasonality and you'd, be, uh, you'd have a bias confounded study. So um, seasonality can be monthly or quarterly or biannual or you know sunspots whatever pattern they are seven or 13 years it can as long as it follows sort of a predictable pattern and observations so what, what seasonality means from practical terms is that observations are correlated at a seasonal interval so uh like uh they can be correlated with uh, uh the month that's 12 earlier for example so if you think about sales uh, in stores, they peak in in um, November, 
when there's Black Friday and also in the holiday season each year. So uh, a, you can predict that knowing um, that sales are the highest, typically the highest in December, that uh, they're probably going to be highest in this December too, right? So we call that uh, uh, seasonality, and that's how it's reflected in the data. So not only do you have local autocorrelation, but you also have this, hey, I know it's December, so I bet you know sales are going to be the highest at Macy's uh, this month compared to any, any other month based on prior seasonal uh, activity. But if you've got quarterly data, it could be they're correlated every fourth uh, quarter is correlated with, with the one four before it, et cetera. So it creates bias when you're comparing different calendar periods before and after an intervention, like in that prior slide, uh, because there are systematic low and high periods for your outcome. And so unequal pre and post seasonal periods, so before and after your intervention, cause bias. If you don't take those into account, that's a problem. So it turns out that we actually model seasonality as part of the time series analysis. So it does take into account and takes care of it as part of what we do. So you don't need to balance the pre and post seasonal cycles when you do time series analysis. It is kind of taken care of. And so you can complete studies quicker. You don't have to wait to make sure you have exactly, you know, three years of, of post data after you, you make some change with time series analysis. As long as you have a long enough pre intervention series, you can adjust for seasonality effectively without getting equivalent time periods pre and post. So why else might you not want to compare, just do an average of the pre to the average of the post? Well, another reason you might not want to do that is trend. So here's a time series analysis and your tax dollars hard at work paid for an intervention of this law that went into effect. Uh, zero tolerance alcohol for uh, drivers under age 21 was implemented in 1994. And you're looking at fatal crash involvements per 100,000 licensed drivers for uh, uh, persons who are under age 21. And um, in 1994, they implemented this law called zero tolerance, where in California anyway, where if they were caught with any measurable alcohol in their blood, that's 0.01 or higher, their license was automatically suspended for a year. That was zero tolerance. It was like really trendy in the 90s. Um, and they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a company evaluate this. And at that line in the plot, um, that's when the law went to effect. And so what do you see, though? Does that look like... Um, this was this series of fatal crash involvements were changing regardless of zero tolerance. Well, hopefully you see a trend. So you got your pre, you got your post period, and this is what they compared. Um, would this be a fair comparison? No. Why? Well, they were trending down anyway. <laughs> so this, I mean, Fewer and fewer uh, persons under age 21 have been getting licensed historically over time, so their fatal crash rates per 100,000 licensed drivers were going down anyway. You can see that with uh, the red line on there is an approximation of that downward trend. And so any comparison post to pre, post is going to be lower just because of this trend that was happening anyway, and it makes uh, laws look effective in this case when in reality it wasn't. So these trends can uh, occur uh, in other ways. They can be trending up. For example, or it could be multiple trends in the series, but they are a problem, and this is a confounded study, and lots of money went to saying how effective this law was, when in reality it was going down at a steeper rate until it hit zero tolerance, and then it kind of got flatter, if anything. So um, it was trending down beforehand, is what I would say. This was a biased comparison. So a little more on trends. They are a source of a bias. They can be linear, so a line does a good job of representing them, or they can be nonlinear. And they can bias your pre post comparisons, as you just saw in that slide, prior slide. Uh, a strong trend, if it exists, means that later times, um, if you compare them to earlier times, they're going to look different, even if the intervention, law change, policy change, whatever, didn't do a darn thing. So trends are modeled, again, like seasonality as part of the time series analysis. So you can do pre post comparisons that are not biased. So finally, um, why not just, again, average the, of the pre-intervention points, the average of the post-intervention points, call it a day? Well, the third reason is autocorrelation, which I talked about earlier, which is the fact that a series is correlated with itself. So local autocorrelation is points closer in time tend to be more similar to each other. So here's a time series of Miami-Dade County pedestrian crashes per 100,000 population. And in January 2002, 2003, and 2004, 
they started implementing changes um, to try to reduce pedestrian crashes in Miami-Dade County. And uh, the blue is the actual values. The uh, uh, dotted blue is what we call a moving average. It's, it kind of makes it easier to see what's going on when things are really messy, like this plot is messy month to month. Um, but when that intervention went into effect, you can see it does look like, at least over time, there was a reduction in pedestrian crashes in Miami-Dade County. They did things like extend the sidewalks out, lower the speed limits, uh, put obstacles, uh, pedestrians can escape to islands, etc. So notice, though, that points that are closer in time, and I just picked a couple of them here, they do tend to be more similar to each other. So there's uh, uh, things close in time being more similar to each other is the result of autocorrelations. That's where I was saying temperatures in um, uh, July, California, are more similar to each other than, temp than July temperatures are to December temperatures, right? Things closer in time tend to be more similar. That's because reality moves forward. So observations nearer to each other tend to be more similar or correlated. It's a good thing because you can use that to predict um, uh, future observations from past observations, but it is a source of bias. It violates the assumption of independent observations. So that assumption that's always there every time we do like a between subjects design and it's independent. Basically, if things are related to each other because they're closer in time than things further in time, it it's a violation of that independence assumption because literally you can use past observations like to predict future observations. So, you know, if uh, uh, like th these, these could be high because there's events going on in Miami-Dade, for example, like uh, like Mardi gras -y type things or parties. And so if they're high on one day, you predict, you know, on that same weekend, uh, you're also going to have high pedestrian <laughs> crash involvement rate, right? Because things closer in time tend to be related for lots of reasons. So a little more about autocorrelation and bias. Um, you can use autocorrelation to model data points later in time from those earlier in time. And this is how some time series methods work, including ARIMA. Observations that are nearer to each other do tend to be more similar, that's correlated. And then the opposite of that's also true. Observations that are further apart in time are more likely to be different from each other. And again, that can be mistaken for a program effect or some intervention effect. Uh, in your pre-post comparisons, if you're just an average pre and average compared to average post, if you don't take this into consideration, you can mistakenly say, uh, you know, this is a program effect when really it's just autocorrelation making it look like there's one. Um, and importantly, autocorrelation uh, violates the independence assumption. It biases the variance estimates is the fancy stat person way of saying that. And um, for all intents and purposes, if you ignore it, um, so you actually did average the pre's and compared it to the averages of post, you uh, uh, actually results in type one error inflation. So because it biases your variance estimates, makes them smaller than they actually should be. And so you end up rejecting the null uh, sometimes when you shouldn't, that is type one error inflation. So what are the goals of typical time series analysis? Well, number one is prediction. So, um, Time series analyses are used to make predictions of some outcome in the future. So stocks, for example, um, they use this extensively in economics and business to uh, uh, make millions and lose millions on the stock market. And also it's how uh, uh, like how Costco knows how many uh, boxes of strawberry pop tarts they should be ordering based on uh the past product sales, sort of the long-term things that, uh, you know, it's the start of the new school year, so seasonal effects, so we should probably get some extra Pop-Tarts. Um, uh, sorry, local auto correlation would say they've been really hot lately, so we should, um, you know, order more than we normally would have. Plus, it's the start of school, so that'd be seasonality, so we know that, you know, parents buy more Pop-Tarts uh, when school starts in the fall. And also, Pop-Tart sales overall have been slowly increasing over time as a result of trend. So all these things are used to help you know um, how many damn Pop-Tart cases you should order at your Costco. So uh, they use time series for business or supply line. Um, and uh, again, millions of dollars are won or lost on the stock market based on these ARIMA models. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I probably used it for the wrong reason. I could be rich. So the other reason we use time series analysis, and this is how we apply it mostly in this course, is uh, 
for explanation. We're trying to explain events that occur. So we want to understand whether changes in the outcome are associated with one or more intervention variables. So programs that were implemented, rule changes, law changes, etc., that occurred, speed limit changes, uh, pedestrian changes, whatever. So did this thing change when we did these things at these points in time, right? And that's basically explanation uh, via the time series method. So the the basic method is this after accounting for as much sort of variability we call it noise in this context sort of why things are varying up and down from time point to time point so we try to account for as much of that as possible using trend autocorrelation and seasonality to predict it and remove it like like a rem or like a, a analysis of covariance with what's left over is there an increase or decrease uh, at the time points associated with your intervention. So we clean it up and then we say, um, after we take out all the noise, all, all the ups and downs that we can predict, uh, is there still a change in that series corresponding with uh, when my program went in effect, we changed the speed limit, they changed the law, etc. So did lowering the legal blood alcohol concentration limit reduce DUI crashes and fatalities? So you look at a time series of that over time, You'd remove trends that were occurring in local autocorrelation, and if there's seasonality, it'd have to be probably annual. And you look at when they lowered the BAC limits in your state, was there a change um, after we clean all that junk out? Was there a reduction in DUI-related crashes or uh, fatalities? Did passing and implementing California's drug diversion proposition, that was Prop 36, reduce recidivism among offenders, right? So you'd be looking at a measure of recidivism over a long period of time among uh, drug offenders, and you'd want to see um, at the point in time where that went into effect, did uh, the recidivism rate actually decrease like we voted for in California anyway with Prop 36? So the specific uh, method we're going to look at in this class for time series analysis is ARIMA, which stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average Time Series Analysis. And it's one approach. There's lots of other approaches, but it's it's sort of a, it's a fancy one. Um, it's also called Box Jenkins Time Series Analysis. It's used, as I said, extensively in economics and business. And the models that it makes are empirically based prediction models. So in normal person language, um, it, SPSS is going to build this background model or noise structure using uh, uh, autocorrelation, seasonality if it exists, trend if it exists. It's going to try to say, okay, here's the best model that fits this, that takes out as much noise as possible. And so it builds that for you empirically based on the series itself. You uh, take that noise out and then you, you see if your series changed at your uh, point that your law changed or that uh, your policy changed or whatever it is. But the models are empirically based, meaning they're built from the data itself. The no we call it the noise structure. So the assumptions are that uh, observations are approximately equally spaced in time. So you got monthly, for example, for example, or annual measures of something outcome. The observations are dependent, right? Um, <laughs> you want your observations to be related to each other. They probably are anyway, particularly if they're closer in time, um, because uh, we use that to take out noise and clean up your series uh, as part of the noise model um, to predict future observations and past ones. You don't want outliers, so outliers really do jack up time series analysis. If you have points that are really, really high or really low compared to the rest of the series, that's a problem. So, for example, they had an ice storm in North Carolina um, this one month for like a week and crash crashes just dropped off the map because no one could drive in North Carolina when there was a, a ice storm. And so that month was super low and it messed up all my models. And so there's ways to deal with that. If you run into it, we can talk about. So the residual. So remember what residual is, is it's what's left over um, after you apply your model and you get what you predict for a time period. So we predict during this month, the crash rate is 10, um, but the crash rate uh, was actually seven, right? So the difference between seven minus 10 would be uh, negative three. So that's what we call a residual or how bad your prediction was for a particular time point. The assumption is that uh, those differences are approximately normally distributed. So after um, you do your model and you, you build it, your prediction um, is equally sort of good and bad um, uh, 
uh, in a normally distributed way. It's not, um, you know, skewed in one way. You're always off in one direction, for example. So this is a weird one. Your mean and variance are stationary. So um, <clears throat> this basically means you have homogeneity variance. And after you uh, have done your model, your mean is zero for the residuals. So uh, the average of that normal distribution of residuals is approximately zero. So um, this one we actually do look at a little bit, so we'll talk about it. But it sounds scarier than it actually is. You just make sure things fall within bounds, and I'll teach you that. And finally, um, probably most importantly, is that after you do your model and you got your residuals, your leftovers, uh, variability you can't account for, that there is no remaining autocorrelation. So there, uh, after you built your model, check out all your noise, maybe the effects of your intervention, there's no longer correlation among the time point residuals, so the leftovers. So again, we will actually definitely look at that one. So in terms of sample size um, that you need to do this, because you probably might do this for this particular program, uh, more people than typical, uh, the more complex a time series is, the more data you need in order to analyze it accurately. So there's no like really simple answer to this question. Um, if you've got a lot of seasonality and things are super jumpy up and down or very rare events, you need a long, long time series to do uh, your analysis. If things are fairly common, that's like a rate of 10% or higher, um, it's not so bad, actually. So usually what we say is you need at least 50 observations for modeling a very complex time series. That would be like monthly counts of something that's super jerky up and down. Um, if there's seasonality, you need at least two seasonal cycles so you can model that seasonality. And, you know, in general, the more time points you have before and after uh, your intervention went into effect, the better, unless you go so far back that it causes bias. So uh, in my driver, driver studies, for example, in the past, I would have so much pre-series that other laws went into effect that could have affected teen drivers. And so uh, uh, I would have to remove those effects, like seatbelt laws went into effect. So if you're looking at fatal crashes over time, and I'm, I want to know if something happened in 92, but I've got the 80s in there. Well, they implemented seatbelt laws, and that also affects, you know, fatal crashes, right? Because they don't die. So uh, if you go too far back, you can run into problems too. So there's sort of a sweet spot you try to hit. So, um, and if you go too far back, you can run into differences in how the outcome was defined. This happened in my dissertation, actually. Um, so I was looking at crash rates of teen drivers over time, uh, all crashes, and they changed that reporting threshold in California. So you used to have to um, report any crash where there was $700 worth of damage or more. And then right in the middle of my time series, when I was, I planned on evaluating the impact of some law, they made it a thousand or more dollars worth of damage. And so crash rates dropped because uh, people stopped reporting them, right? So they redefined the outcome measure in the middle of my time series. That was a problem. So I actually had to redo my whole dissertation proposal, which is another day. So um, note that power does increase as a function of your post-intervention data points. The more you have, the more power you have to detect a change associated with your intervention. And so um, annual data, and mo most students who are sort of new at this would do annual data, not monthly, or even worse, would be like daily, would be crazy. Um, they, they require fewer data points, even 10 may be sufficient. So a 10 year series of say recidivism rates for some particular group and your intervention happens somewhere in the middle is probably fantastic. Um, and there's usually not seasonality in annual data because um, there's just trends usually and autocorrelation. So um, they tend to be simpler. So if the stuff is ab above scared you, just know that for annual data, um, it's a heck of a lot cleaner to do this and you need fewer data points. So how do you build a model in this ARIMA stuff? So you remember in um, uh, multiple regression, SPSS builds it for you and you just have to compare different models and try to pick which one you think is the best. It's kind of the same idea here, but um, you're finding a model that uh, sucks up as much of the variability as possible. That's basically the idea. So remember R squared and the other one. Here you want a good R squared, and uh, you you have to because one of the assumptions is after you've built your model and applied it, there's no more autocorrelation present in the series. 
um, you want a model that uh, results in no remaining autocorrelation in the series. So it's slightly different, but it's the same approach. You apply a couple rules, and that's, that's the model you pick. So step one is what we call model identification, and SPSS does this. There are three components that make up the noise model that SPSS builds for you. That is, it's, it's attempt to uh, flatten out the peaks and valleys in your series by saying, well, that could be accounted for by trend, and that could be autocorrelation, and that could be seasonality. Um, but that's what we call your PDQ. P just stands for your autoregressive parameter, and that's memory for past observations. So um, past observations predict future observations is what an autoregressive term means. So if you have a, uh, a autoregressive term of one, it means each observation is predicted by, uh, to some extent, by the one immediately before it. If you had a, a autoregression of two, it would say um, each observation is predicted by the one before it and the one two before it, to some extent. So um, that's all autoregression means is that sort of like uh, there's memory for past observations and a current observation. And the number just tells you how far, one period back, two periods back, etc. And we call that the lag. So D is integration, um, and this is different same. So it's systematic changes in your slope or variance. So um, in normal person language, uh, it's your trend. So did you have a linear trend? Did you have a, uh, a logarithmic trend, et cetera? And it's, it's usually uh, a, a seasonal trend or a local uh, trend up or down. And then finally, Q is your moving average term. So PDQ uh, follows the A, R, I, and M, A. So now we're on the MA, and moving average is memory for past errors. So that is shocks or deviations from average for the series. So uh, people confuse the AR and MA because they're confusing, but um, uh, autoregressive term says that basically uh, the prior term or the average of a, uh, a couple prior terms predict a current uh, month, right? Whereas moving average says uh, the uh, amount that the prior uh, time period differs from average for the series predicts uh, the current time period. So it's sort of like how how weird the prior one was uh, uh, helps predict uh, today's value. So um, so the AR and the MA are the most common. We do occasionally have to difference things as well to remove trends, but basically SPSS builds this for you. So you can include covariates in your series to control for things. Um, and the goal here is to have SPSS identify uh, the best model, if possible, if possible before the intervention effect actually would hit the series, so on the pre-data. Um, but sometimes you just don't have a long enough series to be able to do this, and so, uh, you know, world's not perfect. <laughs> so you do what you can to graduate. So most processes can be modeled using very basic ARIMA structures. So for example, on AR1, um, Notice it's a one comma zero zero is what we would call that model or PDQ of one zero zero. Means that an observation um, is predicted by the average for the whole series plus a fraction of the prior value. Okay, so that is again memory for past observations. So I I predict this month sales will be whatever average sales are, you know, um, uh, at our store for Pop Tarts plus. Um, uh, some little piece that's predicted by how many we sold last month. All right, so MA, oh, or a PDQ of 001 is an MA1 model, says that an observation is, uh, we can predict that an observation is equal to the series average, so the average Pop-Tart sales, I guess, and then a fraction of the prior values difference from that series uh, mean, meaning how weird the prior month was helps us predict this month's uh, uh, Pop-Tart sales. So that's an MA001 model. And I, I don't expect you guys to actually understand the real difference between these. Just know that it's, you know, prior values predict subsequent values. Sometimes it's, it's what their mean was, and sometimes it's how weird they were. So if there's seasonality in the series, these uh, things are subscripted, the PDQ. So you can have, for example, a model like this where locally there was nothing going on, zero, zero, zero. But there was a moving average of 12 at the seasonal level, meaning each observation um, is predicted by how much the one 12 months before it deviated from the series average. That's a moving average, seasonal moving average uh, model. 
So in building the models, we're still on model identification. Your primary tools for figuring out what the best model is are a time series plot of the data. So this is like one from SPSS shows you what your data look like. The something called the autocorrelation function, and then uh, which is a measure of how strongly each observation is with the one x before it, or x, uh, which could be one period before it, or two periods before it, or three periods before it. So um, it's how how correlated uh, observations are with other observations, um, x units beforehand, one, two, three, four, etc. Now there's something called the partial autocorrelation plot which also pops out and um, where there are big spikes, it tells you that there's a correlation between an observation and observation that is X lags before it, but it sort of partials or removes out the effect of those intervening um, correlations. So it gets rid of the slow sort of die of things over time. Um, <clears throat> so basically it's the combination of these two things, seeing where there's big spikes uh, that tell you what sort of model SPSS should be building. And there's also something called a, a uh, box gung test, and that tells you whether there's residual autocorrelation in your series after the model is built and applied. So really, um, it's kind of trial and error. You let SPSS tell you, hey, I think this is the best one, or I think this is the best one. And you just see, is there still autocorrelation afterwards? Does this make sense? Okay, cool, sounds good. That's mostly how uh, time series analysis goes. So we're still on model identification and um, looking at the ACF and the PACF, the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function, there are patterns that are sometimes in these that tell you um, what sort of PDQ model SPSS should be uh, spitting out for you. So it'll tell you if the series needs to be differenced, whether there are AR or moving average or both types of parameters. And also the lag order. So lag is just uh, uh, prior. So how many observations prior is today's observation associated with or the current observation? Is it one before? Is it 12 months before it? Um, what is that correlation structure? So it is the pattern and location of spikes in the ACF and the PACF that help you identify the correct arima noise model. That is the underlying sort of series uh, behavior that can be predicted by itself through trend, seasonality, and autocorrelation. So you look for where the spikes are, um, and then um, they help you. They 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 would help you if you were having to build it and SPSS wasn't doing it. So seasonal moving average and AR processes show these patterns of spikes at seasonal lags. So 12 month periods or 24 month periods, etc. So. Continuing our model identification, here's what autoregressive processes look like. So SPSS spits these things out, and if you see them, they're sort of the ideal form that tells you what kind of model you have. So if you have this upper one, um, AR processes have exponentially declining ACF spikes, so upper left hand pick there. You can see how they go down, they start high and they go down, uh, decline over time. Um, and uh, and the PACF, they've cleaned out all those sort of slow uh, lags that, that are the correlation fading over time, and they just they parcel them out, so you just see a spike at one. So when you see this sort of pattern, it tells you something's going on with an observation. It, uh, it's correlated with the one, one before it. And when you see the spikes declining in the ACF in a single spike like that in the PACF, that tells you, hey, I've got an ARIMA uh, 100 model or an AR1 model. All right, is that all I really all I wanted to say on that? I guess so. So um, our moving average processes, the spikes are, are switched where they're located. So note um, for moving average processes, this is where you can predict an observation by how much uh, one before it was different from the average. Um, you end up with spikes in the uh, uh, single spike in the ACF or autocorrelation function and then declining spikes in the PACF. So this is what these look like, is the effect of those those uh, weird deviations from the series average kind of look like this. And you can have negative ones, and the one at the bottom here has uh, an observation is correlated with the one one before it and the one two before it. So that's a, a 002 model at the bottom. 
So um, you can also have mixed models that have both AR and MA parameters in them. They look like this. They're kind of a nightmare. So <laughs> you get sort of alternating spikes uh, in the ACF, and then you get declining spikes in the PACF. And this is, for example, an ARIMA 101 model, PDQ. And so uh, they kind of look like this, and they're fairly rare, got to be honest with you. But just for completeness, I present this. All right, so you're ready for the good news. <clears throat> if you've made it this far, um, the good news is SPSS builds the damn models for you. So all that was really not super necessary, except uh, for students who wanted to know kind of what was going on in the background. SPSS does build these models for you. So um, this is expert modeler in SVSS, and here under dependent variables, we're predicting the number of injuries based, uh, and those are uh, injuries to passengers and drivers, um, <clears throat> by an independent variable, that is when the seatbelt law went into effect. And it will actually tell you what the best model is. Expert modeler, we're gonna tell it to do it, RIMA models for us, and it's gonna try all sorts of different models out and tell you what it thinks is the best one. <clears throat> But ultimately, it's up to you to go, yes, this is a good model. And I'll teach you how to do that. Looking, Basically, you don't want any big spikes in the ACF and PACF. That's going to be the secret. So you still need to diagnose that model that SPSS picks. But it's a hell of a lot easier than when I learned this, where you had to look at the spikes and go, well, that's an MA1. You don't have to do any of that crap. Um, you just go with, go with what SPSS picks. So model estimation, um, when SPSS gives you a model, these are the things you want to be true. So any AR or MA parameters, that is, those are kind of like betas in linear regression, they should be between negative one and positive one. They should be bigger than that. And those are what we call the bounds of stationary air, stationarity and invertibility. So, um, you know, they, they represent uh, what fraction uh, of a prior value the current value can be predicted by and you you so it's either you know 100 percent or zero percent that's why it can only range um it can't go above one and um it can be negative because it's like some fraction of the prior observations uh, uh deviation negatively predicts uh the future observations value so that's why it can be negative but basically it can never be bigger than one absolute value so the AR and MA parameters need to be statistically significant. So the usual sig needs to be less than 0.05 for you to say, yes, this is a good model. You don't want models that have a bunch of extra junk in them that you don't need. And most importantly, we're going to look at the ACFs and PACFs and make sure there's no more spikes. We don't want spikes that go beyond these lines that are called the confidence intervals. When they do, it suggests there's still autocorrelation in the series. So there's still something going on in there that... Um, we haven't sort of taken all that noise out yet. So model diagnosis um, is determining if you got a good ARIMA model. So those are sort of uh, 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 the prior ones or if it's even acceptable. But here's how you go. Is this model better than another model? Well, a good model does the following. It accounts for all the autocorrelation in the time series. That is the ACF and PCF, PACF plots do not have any spikes that go beyond the confidence intervals, which I'll show you an example. It has a box lung Q statistic, if you've got one that's not significant. So um, uh, it, it's a test for residual autocorrelation. If it's not significant, that means, hey, there is no residual autocorrelation in this series, and that's a good thing. It has a high R squared, right? So you want, and you're not gonna believe the R squareds here are really, really high. So these ARIMA models are very, very good at using past observations to predict future observations, why they use them on the stock market. So high R squared is a good one, no autocorrelation and um, a box lung that is not significant. That's a good model. And finally, it should make sense, right? So if you're looking at, uh, you know, um, something that, that happens like sales that are, are uh, done on a seasonal or monthly basis, you shouldn't see things that are correlated every like seventh ups, every seventh month is correlated with the one seven before. Like, well, how does that make sense? Like things happen <laughs> in quarterly data and fours and annual data is in twelves usually. Sometimes there are biannual things, but look at it, it should kind of make sense. And then finally, you want a model that's simple, right? So parsimony again, Occam's razor, the simpler the model given two options where things are basically equal on the stuff above. They both have good R squares. They both make sense. They both don't have residual autocorrelation. Pick the simpler model. 
So um, after you've built your noise model and SPSS applies it, you then put in um, your intervention parameter or your variable that represents when your intervention or interventions went into effect. So only after stages one through three are complete uh, should you attempt your intervention analysis. You've got a good model, cool, I'm gonna throw in my intervention parameter and see if uh, after I take out all that noise, is there a change now in the series corresponding with when my program went into effect or the law changed, et cetera. And you force it into your best fitting ARIMA model and you estimate it uh, using the post intervention data too. So you wanna see if the intervention parameters are statistically significant. So if they are, something changed corresponding with your intervention. And if so, you wanna characterize the impact of that intervention. So after event X occurred, the series was X or X, X percent lower than beforehand. You know, the uh, recidivism rate decreased 17% uh, after this program is implemented at the police department. You want to characterize it in that sort of way. So your intervention parameter will be significant, and then you want to turn it into some sort of percent change or something. So your interventions um, in ARIMA don't have to just be on off. There are multiple ways of modeling interventions in ARIMA. So you can have what are called sudden temporary effects. And these are your types of interventions you can model in ARIMA. Sudden temporary effects are things like that click it or ticket advertising they do, where uh, they have the signs on the freeway for Amber's Law say, you know, click it or ticket, you know, buckle up. So those are known to have a temporary effect. So, uh, you know, seatbelt use is sort of scooting along and then it hits uh, uh, click it or ticket month and it pops up because everyone's scared they're going to get a ticket. And then after those signs disappear, it drops back down to normal again. And that's a sudden temporary effect. You can also have sudden permanent effects. So uh, sudden permanent effects, things are scooting along, something changes, and the series changes permanently to a new level up or down. In this case, I've shown it changing up. So when we change uh, in California to mandatory seatbelt use, primary enforcement, meaning the cops could actually pull you over for not having your seatbelt on, um, seatbelt use just shot up and stayed up. Okay, so that was the effect of that seatbelt law, was a sudden permanent intervention. You can also have uh, gradual temporary effects. So uh, DUI checkpoints are sort of like this. So I've done a number of these where, you know, the, uh, uh, the rate of uh, drunk drivers on the road, uh, or, or DUI arrests, I guess, is, is at some level or whatever, and then they uh, uh, are going to have a DUI checkpoint um, on the weekend, and so uh, the cops are more aware of uh, DUI drivers on the road. So they go up for a while, they peak at the point of the checkpoint, and then they drop back down. Um, that would be an effect that's sort of gradual, it gradually reaches its peak, and then it, it's temporary, so it goes away gradually as well. Yeah, that's a bad example, but anything like that where it's sort of there's a slow build up, hits a peak, and then it slowly decreases, that would be modeled as a gradual, gradual temporary effect. Um, then we have uh, 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 gradual permanent. Uh, these are not lining up great. But is the one on the bottom where uh, we we added better testing requirements for young drivers at DMV. For example, making them go on the freeway. Like you can't get anywhere in California in a lot of places without going on the freeway, and it wasn't on the drive test, so we added that. And what happens is it's not like instantly everyone becomes a better driver. Uh, so as shown in the series there's sort of multiple time points for us to reach this new level of, of uh, better driver. Um, it, it takes uh, several years of training new drivers before you reach this sort of peak level of better drivers on the road in California, or everyone renewing their license or something like that. That's what we call a gradual permanent effect. So all these are possible. So come in our intervention analysis to model these different effects, uh, we use a, what's called a dummy variable. And dummy variables are dichotomously coded variables that you create, where it's zeros when the intervention is not in effect and ones when the intervention is in effect. And so think your data file here. Your data file uh, for ARIMA is, is uh, not people, right? It's time points. So each row is a time point. And so it's zero for that particular time point if it was, say, before your law went into effect, and then it's ones afterwards. So zero is not event, one is the event happened or we're under the intervention effect is expected. 
And so here's a couple uh, models for what different effects would look like coded as dummy variables. So you got time. So going down, you've got time 1 to 20. Each row is a time point um, successively. You've got your outcome. Maybe you got a covariate. But let's say you had a pulse effect. You're 0 um, from time point 1 to 9. And then uh, you know click it or ticket happens or whatever. So you're 1 for time point 10 and then zeros afterwards. For uh, an extended pulse, where maybe it was a three month long, these are months, 20 months, a three month long thing, your zeros before for, for time periods one through nine, and then ones during uh, the intervention, and then zeros afterwards. Now, the final one's a step or a, a sudden permanent effect. Uh, this is where like some law changes like Prop 36 in California, it's zero for the time points before the law, one for the time points starting when the law went to effect and afterwards, and it stays there. So these are just different examples. You're, it's interesting that the variables you put in to estimate your intervention effect are just zeros and ones, but that's what they are. It's the, they estimate the change in your series corresponding with one unit change in your independent variable. So it tells you the change that occurred corresponding with your intervention. So pulse, extended pulse, and step. And um, you enter them into your model after you've built your noise structure based on what SPSS has told you. And you've said, OK, this looks like a clean model. They're, it's got a high R squared, and it's got a decent uh, or no remaining spikes in the ACF and PACF. Then we've pushed this in and see if it's significant. All right, so who's excited to do an interrupted time series? Example, I know you are. So let's do one of mine. So. When California passed Proposition 215 in 1997 allowed medical marijuana to be purchased by people who got a recommendation from their doctor, I was working at DMV and the question was, uh, did uh, the 1997 Prop 215 law change that allowed medical marijuana use, I think we were the first in the country, maybe second, but did it um, result in excuse me, more drivers on the road who had cannabinoids, that is marijuana, but we got to use the fancy term because it's science, cannabinoids in their blood uh, on California roadways. Um, further, when they uh, passed a subsequent Senate bill, no kidding, Senate Bill 420 in 2004, did that have an effect? So um, let's see. So our dependent variable here, our, that is the thing that makes our time series, is cannabinoid positivity among drivers killed in fatal crashes in California. So um, it is what percent of them had cannabinoids in their blood, uh, drivers who were killed in fatal crashes in California. So it's not all drivers, it's just fatal crash involved ones because that's kind of like all I had and I was just trying to get my study done. So the time period was 1992, that was five years before Prop 215, to 2009, that was 13 years after Prop 215. And my intervention points, that is sort of my independent variables here, were in 1997 when the initial law went into effect, in 2004 when Senate Bill 420 went into effect, which kind of like um, operationalized the proposition, said, well, how many dispensaries, uh, how you run a dispensary, how many plants you can own, etc and so forth that was uh this law that passed in 2004. so i had some covariates so one of the things is if you're looking for weed among drivers um the number one thing that determines whether you find weed among drivers is uh you tested them <laughs> so testing of weed among drivers is not consistent across time so that was a potential covariate because it was a potential confounder it's related to uh detecting marijuana among the drivers uh, so more testing, you're more likely to find positive, so it's a potential confounder. The other one was uh, people were just sort of, this is a long time period, 97 to 2009, right? And during this, was that, seven years? Inclusive, eight, nine years uh, time period, um, weed use was just kind of slowly creeping up. And so we were talking about trend earlier. There was a trend. So if I was just to compare a post period to a pre period, I'm going to find higher weed use in that post period just because it was kind of going up nationwide. So what I did is... I adjusted like a covariate again, not only for uh, percent of drivers who had their blood tested for cannabinoids, but also uh, uh, drug use, the proportion of drivers in states that didn't pass medical marijuana laws who had cannabinoids in their blood, which you'll see was tr slowly trending upward. So um, that way we can adjust for that and not think that the increase that's just sort of happening in culture or whatever is some effect of the law. So here is that time series for California. 
you've got your state drug testing up top, little P cups, and you can see it kind of went down and up and down and up, and then kind of got all bouncy. So uh, uh, down below, you have a blue line, which is the nationwide trend in the proportion of drivers who had cannabinoids in their blood. And you can see it's kind of it's going up from 1992 to 2009. It was slowly trending upward. That's a trend. The green line with marijuana leaves, that is cannabinoid use among uh, California drivers in terms of fatal injured drivers. So that is the percent who had cannabinoids in their blood. And you can see at some point it does appear to deviate from the nationwide trend, even though for the longest time period they overlapped, right? So testing increased when uh, Prop 215 went into effect, um, but marijuana prevalence did not when we initially passed a law. However, when they operationalized it in 2004, Boom, we got an increase in medical marijuana, or gosh, not medical, marijuana or cannabinoids among, uh, in the blood of drivers involved in fatal crashes. So um, this is what the data file looks like. So you've got time period in the data file from 1992 to 2009. You've got the percent of California drivers who had weed in their blood. The percent of California drivers who were tested, that's a covariate, right? What percent got tested? You can see it's pretty high. The percent of U.S. drivers who had weed in their blood uh, started at 0.9, went to 5 by the end of time, but California started at 1.2 and went to 9, right? And then I talked to you about those intervention variables, and look at Prop 215, 1997, you can see it's zeros before 1997, and then it's ones after, right? How about Senate Bill 420 when they uh, operationalized the law? It's zeros up until 2004 and ones after. So those are your intervention variables. 1997, oh yeah, I even illustrated for you, boom. So first we're gonna get some descriptive statistics and we're gonna use explore to get this by time period. So descriptive, explore. And in here, in our dependent list, uh, I put the California percent of drivers with weed in their blood, that is that proportion series. In the factor list, that is what they call independent variables here. I have California Prop 215 and California Prop SB 420. So those are factors or independent variables. So I'm getting um, counts before and after each of those laws went into effect. What's the average proportion of weed in their blood? So we haven't used Explore in a while. So uh, I put this up here just to kind of remind you, this is how you get separate stats for subgroups before and after uh, these law changes went into effect. All right, why do I even talk? This is what you end up getting. You get uh, per California percent of drivers with weed in their blood. Zero is before Prop 215 went into effect. Average, 1.8%. Uh, um, after, that is there a one for California Prop 215. Average is 5.8. So that tells us that um, these this is sort of the pre-number and that's sort of the post-number, but we know we're not going to compare just those averages because that's... Uh, uh, potentially confounded, but at least gives descriptive statistics for your reader of what the level was before and after this law went into effect. And we do the same thing for Senate Bill 420. There is Senate Bill 420. It was 2.39 prior to Senate Bill 420, and it was 9.32 after Senate Bill 420. So mean cannabinoid prevalence um, was about 1.8% before Prop 215, 5.8% after. Um, but a lot of that after period includes the period that has uh, Senate Bill 420 in it, right? So Senate Bill 420 was 2.4% in its pre-period, some of which was Prop 215 only, and 9.3% afterwards. So is this a real change, or either of these laws associated with the change in medical marijuana, uh, or excuse me, prevalence of cannabinoids among drivers who were involved in fatal crashes in California? That's why we do ARIMA. So further, we want to know uh, if we see a change, probably an increase, was it due to Prop 215, Senate Bill 420, or both? So we're going to uh, have SPSS identify our initial model. And here we've put uh, California percent of drivers with weed in the dependent box. Um, and we have clicked uh, the criteria for ARIMA, so we get only ARIMA models. And um, in this little box here, we've said ARIMA only, so SPSS uh, is going to go through and find us the best ARIMA model that can explain the sort of uh, random variation or noise anyway that's in uh, percent of drivers with weed in their blood. So our initial model identification, we pick some additional things in here. We get parameter estimates under statistics. 
And we get fit values, a residual ACF and PACF under plots. Our initial model, so this is your SPSS output. And again, it's picked what it thinks is the best model. And you can see it picked a 0, 1, 0 model. What's a 0, 1, 0? Remember, that's that PDQ thing. Uh, so remember, it's A, R, I, M, A. So that middle thing is the I, which is like the worst name for <laughs> differencing. But basically says each value, uh, is if you subtract it from the value immediately before it, one before it, um, uh, there is a tr it removes trend in the series. So it's telling you it thinks that there's a trend in the series, but no moving average and no ARIMA parameters are in here. Or excuse me, no autoregressive parameters are in here. Just a, a, a simple upward trend. So it says the series is 010 PDQ. Each observation is predicted just by subtracting it from the one prior. That's a first, what we call a first differencing. And um, notice that our number of predictors is zero and our R squared is zero. We don't have any models in here, or excuse me, any parameters in here. All we have is a mathematical operation. We got the constant, which is the series mean level. And um, we have that we subtract each observation from the one prior to it. That is our model according to SBSS. So there again, constant is the mean level of the series, not significant. So it's basically zero and then the differencing of one. So um, nothing significant in this model, and we have an R squared of zero. So what does this look like if we diagnose this? So remember, the goal of diagnosis is to make sure that we don't have residual autocorrelation. So we look at um, uh, the, the, the plots, so it's kind of visual, which is why I'm good at this, I think. Look at the residual autocorrelation and the par and, and, uh, partial autocorrelation and autocorrelation function. And see those little spikes that are coming out on the other side of sort of a middle point for each of those? And then see how there's lines, uh, dark lines out there? You're looking to see that none of those uh, spikes cross those lines. If they don't, you do not have residual uh, autocorrelation in your series. So looking at them, um, no, none of these spikes right here go past these two lines. In the partial autocorrelation function, none of these spikes, these things, go past these lines. So this suggests there is no residual autocorrelation in the series. So just differencing it appeared to take care of any autocorrelation that did exist. Now the fit down here, this is what we call your fit plot. So red is what act the actual uh, uh, percentage of weed in driver's blood look like. The blue is what's predicted by the model, the fit. And you can see it's kind of off, right? So it's off by one data point and then kind of shifted forward in the blue. And that's because of the differencing that occurred. So it's one time por point moved forward um, and it, it follows the pattern kind of, except for that last uh, time point, but it's not a very good model. So we look at those, none of the spikes in the ACF or PACF exceed the lines. Those are called confidence intervals and that's good. So there's no residual autocorrelation. And the values that are predicted by the model, the blue line track reality, but they are shifted one unit due to differences. And that was done to remove linear trend that was a slow increasing trend. So this model seems like it's okay. Um, let's add our intervention effects to see if uh, they change anything. So we've gone back in. We've now added um, the two intervention dummy variables in the independent variables box. There they are. We're going to click criteria to tell SPSS that these are event variables. They're not continuous. Um, and there we go. And we have to tell SPSS um, that there are interventions for them to uh, be kept in the model. So there we've done it. We've clicked event there and there and continue. So here's what we get now. We've got that model where it's a 0, 1, 0 model. See that up there? It's still 0, 1, 0. Each observation is predicted by simply differencing it or subtracting it from the one prior. And generally that's done to remove linear trends. So in this model, um, 0, 1, 0, we have 71% of the variance accounted for, right? So that's pretty darn good. So all we did is subtracted each variable from the one prior to it, and then we have two intervention effects in here. And um, that alone accounts for 71% of the variability, that is the year-to-year -year variability in uh, a proportion of drivers with medical marijuana in their blood. So SPSS, note down here, um, what's left in the model is SB420, but 
Prop 215 isn't shown, right? And so what's going on is uh, SPSS kicked out Prop 215. It said it wasn't statistically significant and it booted it. So um, uh, that's why it's not shown in the model anymore. So SPSS rejected the Prop 215 intervention, but kept the SB421. It has a SIG, if you look over here, that's less than 0.05. So SB420 is associated with a 5.1 percentage point increase in cannabinoid prevalence among fatal crash involved drivers. How do I know that? Right here, the estimate. So first of all, SIG's less than 0.05. The estimate here, like this is a percentage of drivers with blood or excuse me, uh, cannabinoids in their blood. So if you just sort of round that to a percentage, 5.1, that's the change in the series corresponding with the implementation or passing of Prop 420, 5.1 percentage points, and it's positive, so it's an increase. So let's check out this intervention model. Does it seem to do a good job? So we're looking at the ACF and PACF again to see if there's any spikes that go beyond the PACF and ACF. Um, none here do, right? So none of these spikes go beyond these lines. But up here in the PACF, what's this right here? That spike goes beyond the confidence interval. That suggests there is some residual autocorrelation in this series. So the values that are in um, the blue ones that are predicted by the model compared to the red ones, which are the reality, they are even closer to where they were before, I think, but they're still kind of shifted, right, due to the differences. So they're like one time point off. You can see it's almost like they took the red one, turned it blue, and scooted it to the right one time period. So this model is just okay um, from my experience. Maybe there we might be missing something that would account for the residual autocorrelation that we see there and the shifting that we see here. What might that be? Well, let's go back into our model and say, is the increase just due to changes in the drug testing of drivers that is confounding? Is the increase just a reflection of uh, a slow upward trend in medical marijuana or excuse me, med marijuana use in the United States, as modeled by that um, series I have that is all other states without medical marijuana laws, what their proportion of drivers with cannabinoids in their blood was over time? Let's put those two covariates in the model and see what happens um, to the effect we found uh, in the residual autocorrelation and the fit. So here I've added in this dependent variables box, California percent of drivers tested and uh, US percent of drivers with weed in their blood. Those are two covariates. So this is kind of like a, a ANCOVA. It's going to not only adjust for any ARIMA parameters, it only found differencing. Then it, it's going to adjust for uh, these two covariates and then it's going to say, is there any change in medical marijuana, I keep doing that, uh, marijuana prevalence uh, among fatal crash involved drivers associated with either of these law changes. Um, and further, we're going to force uh, SPSS to keep its 010 model. So we're not going to say, hey, go try to re-estimate all the noise. Just use 010 so we can get this done. So we click in there, we click criteria, and we force it to do a 010 model. So we've done it right here. We said do a 010 model. That's what it picked before. And um, we also have to apply differencing, one differencing, to um, all of the intervention parameters as well. So all of these independent variables, we also, because we've shifted the dependent variable one over, we have to shift all the other variables one over. And we do that by applying that same differencing of one to all of them. So um, that's what we're going to do. All right, so here's what we get when we do this. Note, first of all, that down here, Everything is differenced by one, um, not only the DV, but also all of the intervention parameters and the covariates are all difference one, difference one, difference one, difference one, difference one. So model, because we forced it as a zero, one, zero, which means differencing of one model. Um, and it includes everything though. Now we've got the two covariates in it and notice that uh, Prop 215, we also made it keep that as well because <laughs> I wanted to show it wasn't significant. Um, and so this is the, an even better model, right? It accounts for 79.9% of the variance. I think it was 71.4 beforehand. So this model is even better than the prior one. Um, there's Prop 215, um, the initial medical marijuana law in California. Note this is not statistically significant. So that 0.589 is not less than 0.05. So that tells us that 
passing of Prop 215 in 1997 was not associated with a significant change in the proportion of drivers who had uh, cannabinoids in their blood. Okay, so that's basically zero is what it's saying because that is not less than 0.05. How about Senate Bill 420? Senate Bill 420, statistically significant, right? Six less than 0.05. Um, how much, uh, so it's a real change associated with Senate Bill 420. What was that change? Well, it's 4.97, right? So if you round that, it's about five percentage points. Let's just call it that. So it was slightly higher when we didn't have the covariates, right? But basically, Senate Bill 420 is still found to be associated with about a five percentage point increase in uh, uh, the prevalence of drivers with cannabinoids in their blood. Finally, our two covariates, um, not significant, not significant. <laughs> So this suggests that um, neither testing nor the U.S. trend in marijuana prevalence uh, did a lot of adjusting of the California driver cannabinoid prevalence rates. But I kept them in anyway, just because this is a good looking model. So how about the spikes in the fit? What do you see? Do any of these spikes in the ACF or PACF go beyond the confidence intervals? Nope. All of them are clear. None of them go beyond the confidence intervals. We've managed to remove that variability by adding those uh, predictors in the model, those covariates. So the values predicted by the model, that is the blue down here, they do track even closer to uh, uh, the real values. They're still somewhat shifted, but gosh, that's awfully close. Better than a straight line would do, right? So these models, again, are used to uh, make millions of dollars on the stock market because they fit things so closely. So all signs point to uh, this being a pretty good uh, model and that SB420 increased cannabinoid prevalence about five percentage points among California drivers. So uh, ARIMA is the only thing you have this week to do that is new. So make sure you take your time, uh, you help each other out. And if you have questions, go ahead and post them uh, in the discussion and I will do my best to answer them.